to share the work that they're doing. And thanks to all of you who found time on a Friday morning before Thanksgiving when uh, the entire community is a little bit tired. Um, but here you are and um, uh, ready to think about some new new ways of approaching the, the classroom and also the mentoring that you do and the instruction outside of the classroom that you do. So. Um, I'm going to give each of the panelists a chance to introduce themselves, but before launching into that, uh, I wanted to mention a couple of things. You know, first, um, we are research one, right? The University of New Mexico is a research one. And I know that there's a false narrative that circulates that researchers aren't capable of communicating to the general public um, or to the students, and that probably folks who are not engaged in research are going to be better instructors on the undergraduate level and perhaps on the graduate level as well because they're not as rarefied, uh, not as buried uh, in a particular narrow field. But I think that's a false narrative. Um, and in fact, um, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that uh, teaching about research and engaging students in research uh, and also bringing our own research into our teaching work is a high impact practice. That's a phrase from um, George Cook that has been popularized over the last 10 to 15 years. A high impact practice is a practice that engages in particular students who are typically underrepresented in the academy um, and makes it possible for them to persist uh, and also achieve at a higher level. Research is one of the identified high impact practices, whether we're working on the undergraduate or the graduate level. So all of our panels today have been using research as a high impact practice in their teaching. And I suspect that they also have benefits to their own research that they can testify to as a result of having engaged students, again, at a variety of different levels in the, the research that they're thinking about or in research projects specifically designed for them. Um, before I kind of launch launch it and, and ask everyone to introduce themselves, I guess I wanted to give a, a little bit of stage setting in terms of my own experience bringing research um, into the classroom and also the classroom and my mentorship of students into my research. For years, I was just fascinated by the fact um, that I would have students uh, from Taiwan, uh, from China, from West Africa, um, from Central America, and they would come to my classroom um, or to our graduate program in foreign languages and literatures, and they invariably were interested in um, literary works by folks like Toni Morrison and Maxine Hong Kingston. Um, and I was just kind of stunned at, you know, what is it exactly um, about these literary works that seems to speak so powerfully to students from very different cultural contexts. Uh, and that actually, that, that being curious about that passion that my students had, um, even though they were not American and were not, you know, in, immersed in American culture, that passion that they had and also the, the way that they wrote um, about uh, world literature uh, was something that informed um, and kind of built um, my second book, Heroines and Local Girls, which came out two years ago. Um, if it hadn't been for that curiosity that my students, my international students had, I would never have had the idea to write heroines and local girls. So it goes both ways. Um, so uh, let me um, ask if I can uh, each of our panelists to introduce themselves. And I'm hoping that you can tell us a little bit about how you integrate research into your company. One more note, um, folks uh, who are here um, with us, if you want to throw questions along the way into the chat, I'll be monitoring those and I'll try to integrate them into our, our discussion. So our first question again for our panelists is can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about how you integrate research into your teaching? And I'm hoping that um, Silvia Celedon Patiches can begin. And my name is Silvia Celedon Patiches. I'm in the Department of Language Literacy and Social Cultural Studies. Thanks for the invitation, panel and and Julia, um, it's exciting to share the work um, that happens as part of the research that we do. I've been really fortunate um, since early in my career to be engaged with different National Science Foundation funded projects. Um, and the way that, that we've integrated the research into our own classes is that from the beginning, um, the projects that I engaged with were really across institutions. Um, one was the Center for the Mathematics Education of Latinas, Latinos, 
Um, the ultimate goal of that project was to create a cadre of um, doctoral fellows, postdoctoral fellows, teachers in school districts that we partnered with to have an integrated knowledge of language, culture, and mathematics. Um, and with that, with that project, we there's been a great network that has been created. The different research projects that have been a part that were a part of that center um, are being disseminated across, and those have been have offered counter evidence to the deficit views that are often voiced about children from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds who are learning mathematics. Um, so we bring a lot of those video exemplars that we've collected from kindergarten classrooms, from middle school classrooms, um, and so on into our own um, teaching as we prepare mathematics, elementary mathematics teachers um, to teach mathematics. So that is one way we connect um, scholars from across institutions. Um, to our own classes. And that's done through Zoom and other means. But I'll, I'll stop right there and um, let others continue. Okay, the problem with this panel is that I'm gonna to wanna to ask a lot of questions about how exactly is this done and, and how are people right. responding? Yeah, um, so let's hop on. Um, and uh, Dr. Sakine Chavi, I hope I got your name right. Would you tell us a little bit more about your work and who you are? Hello everyone, I am Sakina Chabi, Assistant Professor of Mechanical Engineering, and it is a great pleasure to be here. I've been at UNM since 2018. So how I integrate research into my teaching, the short answer is by aligning my teaching with my research program. So fortunately, uh, currently there is good connection between what I teach, what I cover in the classroom, and what I do, what my students do in the lab. And uh, it uh, took uh, some time to make this connection. Um, but uh, for example, I do remember in my first semester, my teaching wasn't influenced by my research. I didn't talk about my research, or I didn't share my research with my students. And as far as I remember, that experience didn't go that well. At least I didn't enjoy it. And of course, if I don't enjoy it, uh, the students learning as well wouldn't uh, be the best. But then I realized that if I want to make the teaching more productive, both for me and my students, then I need to start changing the syllabus or modifying them a little bit so that I highlight um, teaching materials that are more related to what I do in the lab, more in the classroom. And that um, was um, uh, very productive and make even the learning process for students um, uh, much uh, more productive. And another thing, uh, that uh, method that I use to bring research into my teaching is uh, via the lab. For example, right now I teach engineering material science. It is a combination of lecture and lab. So the lab component allows the students to do lots of experiment, learn how to use a new equipment and do lots of hands-on activity. And these hands-on activities it is uh, students very much interested in. And I just want to add uh, another point and is that I am not the only person who brings her research into the classroom. My students also have the opportunity to bring their research in the classroom. How? By giving a class presentation. Uh, my students have um, the opportunity to present whatever topic they are either interested on or some of them, for example, they work on some research project either at their workplace or maybe in the past. So I told them, okay, why don't you come and talk about your research? And again, um, based on my experience, students really learned a lot from class presentation as well. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. Um, I wonder if we could go next to uh, Dr. Ted Hohola, who's joined us. Hi, everybody. Ted Hohola. Um, 
And I guess, you know, essentially, um, in terms of how it is that I've been able to present um, my work, uh, my scholarship was in 2011, I helped to found the Indigenous Design Institute. I'm afraid you lost your Planning Institute here in the School of Architecture. And, and uh, because of um, how it is that we, or in terms of how it is that we present um, the ability in order to be able to assist communities on the ground with issues uh, dealing with design and planning, um, we basically have built a huge foundation that is pedagogically driven that has actually been integrated into the curriculum for our school. So our community and regional planning program, for example, is the only program in the nation that offers a graduate concentration in Indigenous planning. Uh, we work at the professional uh, division level as well as with uh, tribes, as well as with other um, students and faculty, all for the purpose of sharing our approach to community development, which is how you use culture and identity as a way to uh, inform community development. So at any one given time, we're juggling upwards of half a dozen projects that we've got in. Um, and I think- Sort of lend us opportunity to focus, keeps us in, on our toes. And, and um, I think that from you know, how it is that, that this translates to my own passion um, around uh, identity and culture and how then it can really be integrated into the academe. Um, I think that kind of staging has really been fortuitous from that standpoint. So um, that's essentially the kind of short story of uh, how it is that we've uh, accomplished this. Thank you so much. Um, and your internet's, I think, a little bit unstable. Um, so folks may have some more questions about what you said because they, it was kind of in and out. But I think we got, we got the gist. So thank you so much. Um, Dr. Matson. can you tell us a little bit about what you do? Yes, hello, everybody. I'm Hannah Matson. Um, I'm an assistant professor in the anthropology department. And I'm a Southwest archaeologist. Um, so um, the primary way that I, my research and teaching are really closely integrated, um, uh, primarily related to the nature of my field work and the classes that I teach and um, uh, the objects that result from my research. So I teach um, our department's summer field schools. Um, it's been a little weird with the pandemic, but that's the plan going forward and I have for the last um, three years or so. So that's an immersive summer um, class for, for archaeology students and where they learn to do archaeological field work. In the process, we collect um, a large assemblage of material that then comes back to the lab. Um, the summer class then ends, but then we've got these huge collections that need to be analyzed. Um, and in this way, actually being um, uh, junior faculty is sort of has, has been good for me because you know I don't yet quite have the funding to analyze all those materials so it's made me get really creative with how I can sort of draw on um, student interest to help me do that and so my um, undergraduates have the opportunity then throughout the school year not just the ones that work took my field school but in any of my any classes um, have the opportunity to come and volunteer in my lab and receive training in artifact analysis. They can um, do it through volunteering, through independent studies with me. I've had students um, do um, honors theses, McNair projects um, on the collections. And then I also use those collections in an advanced laboratory class that I teach. Um, where the students are both learning how to analyze artifacts, but at the same time, they're helping me sort of collect, <laughs> collect my data. Um, so it's, it's really been mutually beneficial for me. Super, thanks so much. Um, and last of all, uh, Dr. Turner. Hi, everybody. I'm Tom Turner. I'm a biology professor, and I'm also a curator of fishes in the Museum of Southwestern Biology. Some of you may or may not know about our museum, but we serve uh, the public in terms of providing uh, materials for research, and we work with lots of conservation agencies in the state and in the region. 
Um, you know, what's great about going last is people hit virtually everything you wanted to say. So, um, you know, I, I wanted to talk about one thing that I think it has been the toughest part of, of aligning, like um, one of my colleagues said, aligning their research and their teaching. And the hardest part is when you teach these large undergraduate classes and you're thinking about how to get a meaningful research experience or, or to connect the students to research uh, in those classes. And the one thing that has been successful for me is really adding in some of the, the research that we're doing in New Mexico that links to topical uh, kinds of things. So we had wildfires, big wildfires in the southwestern part of New Mexico, and we were able to talk about our work on Gila trout. And it got some students excited. And then I was able to engage those students directly and get them to work in the lab or work with us in the museum. And so to really kind of help students see that there's research opportunities that they can come in and, and work um, directly with a community of scholars who are interested in those kinds of, of problems. But otherwise, I'd love to hear from other panelists about how, how they're able to make that connection at the undergraduate level in big courses. I also teach graduate courses my most recent project is uh, one where we're trying to get together people from anthropology, geography, uh, earth and planetary sciences, and biologists to use the museum as a way to think about interdisciplinary science problems and to use those resources a lot like Hannah Matson was talking about to, um, to facilitate interdisciplinary research. And there's lots of fun that goes behind that, but a lot of challenges. The big challenge is, is to obtain literacy in other people's fields enough literacy that you can actually sit down and have a conversation and brainstorm ideas and things like that. So a couple of challenges at every level, but um, it's really one of the, it, it is certainly the best thing about my job. And, and I really enjoy teaching and connecting to uh, hands-on activities. So thanks. Great, thanks so much. Um, so this is, as we kind of transition to some of the um, next questions, uh, this is kind of a moment to let you all know uh, about uh, Dr. Tim Schroeder's work on um, what we call eCure. It's an expanding course-based undergraduate research uh, program. And basically it's a multi-year NSF grant uh, with a number of collaborators. Um, there are opportunities for all of you um, and your colleagues uh, to become involved and become a fellow. Um, and it kind of walks you through this, this problem of how do you bring undergraduate research into even very large courses, um, you know, how would, how would you design around that? How do, you, how do you go about the steps that are involved in making it possible for students to engage in research, even if they're beginners? Um, and it doesn't just have to be large courses, it can be smaller courses as well. Um, and the lovely thing is that there's an opportunity to um, work with people who have some experience and who kind of designed a model around undergraduate research. And Dr. Schroeder just popped in uh, to the chat a link uh, to how to become involved in, in that. So our next question is actually um, follows really nicely on um, from Dr. Turner, what Dr. Turner just shared. How do you make research in your teaching doable or accessible for beginners, whether they're undergraduates or graduate students? Can you provide a specific example of how you did this? And I'm going to go ahead and maybe ask, um, I'll sort of try to do it in a slightly different order. Uh, let me ask Dr. Matson to talk maybe a little bit more. She gave us some nice examples in her opening, but some of the specifics about how you do that with beginners. Yeah, so um, there's a couple ways. So I, I over the years, I've worked with, a, I would say, a small army of undergraduates on my project, a lot of people. And so that is an issue of how do you, you know, a lot of them have no previous archaeology experience whatsoever. Um, so I typically put out a call um, each year. And then um, I have groups of undergrads then all train together. Um, and so we have these sort of intensive training sessions. Um, that I lead sometimes graduate students that are familiar with the project also help out in, in that way. Um, but I find that it works better um, for me, at least given the, the number of students that I deal with to sort of um, sort of train them in groups um, to sort of bring them up to speed. Um, another thing that's been really effective, um, and this is not necessarily just with my research, is um, I have um, there are a lot of graduate students that could really use some help on their research projects. And so I, in the past, have put out calls to graduate students and been like, hey, who needs help 
you know, with, with, with their analysis or something like that. Um, you know, and then a few will respond and I put out a call to the undergrads in our department who, who wants some hands-on experience. And then we connect the two and um, it, it works out fabulously for both of them. And then that undergraduate gets like this really wonderful um, sort of one-on-one -on -one training experience with a graduate student. That's great. Thank you so much. And that's brilliant to um, have that matching the dating going on that that way. Really, what a great idea. Dr. Chabi, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the specifics of how you engage beginners? Yes, that is a very good question, because in fact, depending on either the student is graduate or undergraduate, uh, we need to use different approaches. But my general approach uh, was always like this, that first I need to get students interested in the topic, in the research. Then I need to engage them and encourage them to do research. And finally, I really need to show them that you need to, for example, exactly do this. How to? So for example, how I get them, and um, before getting into the detail, I just would like to say that let's say I have 50 students in my class. My purpose isn't to turn these 50 students to 50 researcher. No, maybe not all of them necessarily would like to be researcher. And uh, that's something that I always remind myself that I need to have balance, like how much research I am going to cover in my classroom. I also, uh, maybe sometimes you don't need to push students into research that much. But how I get them interested, sometimes I simply do very simple thing. Let's say, for example, I teach supercapacitors today. I just search the latest news. I Google it, the latest news on supercapacitor, especially if it is undergrad students. Then I go to classroom and tell them that, for example, Tesla decided to make this kind of supercapacitor. Then students, when they can see the relation between what we cover and what's happening in their real life, then that gets them interested in the topic. So once at least I have, let's say, 10% of students interested in the topic, that, that is good. I mean, that is better than nothing. Then I will provide them with resources because sometimes, for example, they come to me, tell me how to do research. I tell them that, for example, they can take problem courses here uh, in uh, mechanical engineering, we offer problem courses, which is basically individual study to do research with, for example, uh, with um, faculty, or if there is, for example, some scholarships or internship, I post them or share them with my students. And uh, then um, another thing that is important about um, engaging um, undergrad students is that at the beginning, I know that I really need to make them feel that they can do it. So I provide them with the support. Support is also very important to support them and make them feel that they are good at doing research. That's that's great. Um, yeah, the being able to do it is is huge. And those initial barriers and discouragements can really you know, push a student out of uh, wanting to participate and even out of a classroom, unfortunately. Um, would any of the other panelists like to speak to this question? I'm seeing some ideas in the chat as well. Maybe I'll go. Um, I was trying to write it up in case I needed to exit for the dissertation proposal hearing, but um, so, yeah, I mean, some things that I think um, resonate with what Hannah was talking about is that when we, in the projects that I have been engaged with, I've been very fortunate that other team members also take um, this idea that we decenter ourselves as researchers and place at the center the students, the teachers, the commu their communities. Um, and really that is done by offering professional development, um, lots of professional development on how to prepare to take up different roles. So we've had in the, the examples that I'm drawing from, we've been working with my husband, Marios in electrical and computer engineering to integrate mathematics and computer programming in bilingual middle schools. Um, 
in an urban and a rural context. And I think there we see multiple opportunities to bring in the graduate students, to bring in the undergraduate students. And what Tom was referring to the near peer mentoring, it's really, um, you get to see this in these projects where the undergraduates are working alongside uh, middle school kids who are taking on co-facilitator roles to teach other middle school kids and middle school teachers how to do coding, how to um, learn about hexadecimal numbers or binary numbers. And, um, and it's exciting work because they get to take the lead. We position them in that way that yes, you can do this. Um, and we are there for support to cheer them on and prepare them uh, with very explicit recommendations on um, what it's gonna take to get them from this level to the next. And um, I think some of the challenges that we're facing now, as you can imagine with NSF projects, um, we have brilliant and undocumented students who will graduate as valedictorians of their class. And um, so trying to find pathways and supporting them and their families um, to get the status that they need to continue to next levels is really critical as well. That, that's the advocacy piece as well that I think is often needed in, in diverse communities. Um, so I wanted to mention that because I think that's a part that also takes us away from the research, right? And, and we've got to be prepared to enter from multiple ways. Um, the work that is needed and that will make a difference in, in their lives. Thank you. Um, that level of commitment that you're speaking about and being ready to uh, accept the commitment that comes along with this as you extend out to other communities is, is really critical um, and challenging. <laughs> mm -hmm. Dr. Hohola or Dr. Turner, would either of you like to chime in? Yeah, I can chime in. I'm going to turn off my video because I think my bandwidth is not great. So, um, but I, I basically teach the uh, final studio at the undergraduate level and also the capstone graduate student in our graduate program. And our institute works to provide funding uh, with the kind of groups that we work with in order to immerse the students in actual real world modeling uh, in terms of their um, work on the ground. And these um, activities are uh, staged in terms of actually working within community. Um, the one that we did last semester, for example, in the undergraduate work with the Borellas community on a place knowing project um, they're required at the end of this to actually produce a professional deliverable that transfers to the community. We just learned recently that that became the base document, for example, for the community to express their concern about the soccer proposal, uh, stadium proposal, uh, and getting more direct community engagement and input into that process for the city. Um, the studio that we'll be doing this coming spring We'll work with Diné College in Saley, Arizona to look at a brownfield site, which used to be an old trading post, and working with um, their students and their faculty in the Bachelor of Fine Arts program to um, engage their community of artists to see how they can rebuild that in a way that benefits their local economic development and diversifies it. So um, I guess, you know, from that standpoint, as their final experience, and we really are uh, committed to getting them to actually take all of the practices and principles that they learned in their coursework and apply it in a real situation where um, the deliverable is actually a uh, bona fide official uh, public policy or uh, strategic planning document. And I'll just echo quickly what Ted said. Um, the problem-based idea, um, you know, so setting up, you know, I'll just give you an example of something we did. We just have a brainstorming session once a week that includes everybody in my lab from our first starting graduate students, our undergrads working in the lab, everybody in the museum. 
And we put a problem up there and we said, we're going to spend the semester kind of working on this. And uh, this really does help people kind of really see the connection between their research skills and growing their research skills and how that actually makes a difference or it, you know, satisfies their career aspirations. And I think linking those, you know, linking a person's, you know, sort of development as a researcher, as a scholar and where they want to go in life is really crucial. I think that was something that was missing for me. This is going to get into another question, but as a kid, I didn't really realize you could be a professional biologist. So making that connection, especially for some of our students that are coming in, um, you know, from rural communities that you, they may not know that you can make these connections. I think that's crucial. So that's a great idea is to really have that problem solving kind of viewpoint. That's wonderful. Thank you. And I think um, you've all started to answer this this next question. And um, panelists, I'm skipping a, a little bit here to to quite to a, a later question. I wanted to ask what specific small steps instructors can take if they want research to become integrated into their teaching. So all of you have actually fairly fully fledged um, programs for uh, integrating undergraduates, integrating um, children who are community members, um, integrating other institutions and the students there. Um, but what's a, what's a set of small steps that somebody who's just starting out could take um, in order to get research as part of their relationship with their students in the classroom and outside of the classroom? And maybe we could, um, Tom, you want to just kind of follow on because you were already going there anyway. Well, you know, I mean, just to sort of follow this theme, we had a really interesting discussion last night about one of uh, the misconceptions about science that really caused people to have a lot of trouble, and, and COVID has really made the, a big, uh, you know, really put this in the forefront, is that science and research are dynamic activities, right? They, they are not something that we produce knowledge that's set in stone, but it's always evolving. And so getting that kind of idea into your classes is, you know, for a biologist, it's, it's pretty easy because we have some topical stuff that we can kind of start to talk about and say, hey, what's your feeling about this and kind of do a nice back and forth. And people then start to understand that these data come from somewhere. These interpretations come from somewhere and they're coming from people who are sitting around talking about these ideas and working on these data. So I think that's something simple you can do in your classes where you can just connect with your students on topical issues in research and then, um, you know, kind of uh, use that as a springboard to get, let them understand that they can, they themselves are part of this process and can be part of this process. It sounds like Dr. Shabi is already doing that in her examples of talking about Tesla and, and other things that are showing up in the news. But Dr. Shabi, you want to follow on? Uh, sure. I agree with what Tom said that making the connection between teaching and research uh, is really extremely important and everyone will benefit from such a relationship. And I will give you a few examples on this, but um, how I did it, for example, um, in spring semester, I teach energy storage and conversion system. I developed this course from scratch. It is completely based on what I've done in the past and my research. So uh, that is uh, one, uh, not a small step. In fact, it is very essential step. It is the key in my opinion, that if you wanna make great connection, then you need to align your teaching with your research, meaning you are going to teach something which is at least closely, if I am if not saying that it should be exactly, you should be teaching what you are researching. That is um, one thing. Then when, for example, I did that, like in spring, I teach energy storage, which is exactly what we do in the uh, lab, then uh, it is very easy for me to just refer my research each time, whenever I mention something uh, as example to make my point about uh, the teaching materials. And uh, when, uh, by doing so, I got the students interested in the topic. Then students, for example, came to me and they said, okay, for example, okay, you talked about hydrogen energy and how important it is. And you also showed us how to make hydrogen generator. It's exactly what happened last year. Then he told me, okay, now I wanna make hydrogen generator as class project. Then I told him, yes, sure. And if you need help, let me know. He did it. And in fact, he even didn't ask for my help. Then that got him really interested into the entire renewable energy topic. 
Then he came to me and said, okay, now I want to do research with you. I want to join your research group. Then he joined my research group. And of course, we worked more on this specific area. And after that, uh, how I uh, helped him more into this field, there were some positions, internship. Anyhow, he got internship at Sandia. He went to Sandia. So now what I'm saying is that it is like a cycle. Everyone, researcher, instructor, students, community will benefit from this integration. And to make this integration work, we really need to relate it also to students' life. Like tell them, okay, you are not going to get a good job if, for example, you just want to, if you don't want to do research. If you want to get a good job, if you want to have a bright future, it would be good for you to join a graduate school. Now, what is hot topic? Renewable energy is really hot. So something like that, we really need to not only connect teaching and research, but we also need to connect research to innovation, to discovery, and then connect it to the future, how it's going to impact students' life. That's how, I mean, my general approach toward making the connection to make sense for my students. I'm, I'm hearing in all of this uh, intentional work to create researcher identity uh, in, in students. And you know, this, is, this is sort of uh, light and friendly, but it, it kind of illustrates the, the point. I know that de the Department of Biology recently had students write, I am a biologist, and just draw a little picture of who they are as a biologist um, on some of the tableware that's used routinely in um, the biology department, all you know, from very tiny things like that to these larger things of creating a link to internships all of these create identity um, fairly early on. Dr. Matson or um, Dr. Hohola, would you like to chime in on these, these specific steps? Yeah, so I guess an, another way um, to approach this that, that I have done in the past is to sort of start with my research and look at my different research projects and ask myself what components of these projects um, could undergraduates be involved in, not having a whole lot of previous experience, what components of these could I um, sort of transform into educational experiences? So I often start with the research and then, you know, um, could I make it, you know, maybe a lab in a class? Could I make it, you know, part of a project or, you know, kind of, and I know this is more long term, could I even create an entire class around this thing? Um, I have a colleague at another university that needs to do this huge pottery analysis project um, for his research, and he created an entire undergraduate class, semester long class, where the students would receive that special training they would, would learn how to analyze the material in this sort of structured supervised setting in the museums. Um, and I just, um, I think that's brilliant, you know, so then the students gain those skills. You also, um, as a researcher, you know, um, are, are getting a huge benefit as well. Um, and I also just wanted to touch on um, what Sakina was saying about, it's also been my observation that particularly with undergraduates, it's like, as soon as they can get that sort of um, research experience, right? It like creates this whole momentum, you know, for them. It's like all of a sudden then, you know, they feel confident enough, you know, to maybe do something else, to volunteer for something else, to get involved in something else. And then before you know it, you know, they're like applying for graduate schools and they're just like, kind of they just take off you know and it, you can really see how it really starts with that like um maybe it's even in a 100 level class you know just like a call for volunteers or any kind of just just one-on-one -on -one, like um sort of touch point you know that uh, of involving them in research in some way it just um it can just it can just take off I love the passion with which all of you are speaking about the things that you've made happen for students. It's really, it's really tremendous. Um, Dr. Hohola, did you want to chime in here um, with specific steps? Sure. Um, you know, when we uh, get our students even to submit their application, the key questions that we pose to them that we review for uh, admission is to ask them 
really, um, what is it that they want to do? What is it that they uh, want to see changed and how they themselves kind of position themselves in terms of their um, work up until this point that um, could get them to be the advocate that they want. So it's really from the get-go, uh, getting them to identify with the role and making them uh, acknowledge and also understand the kind of strengths that they're bringing in. And um, I think it finally ends up challenging them to sort of uh, position themselves and say, if you're in a community and you're talking about the vision of the community, what kind of person would you want to come and help the community to represent what you uh, feel is important? And uh, um, then the issue is, uh, would you be that person? And what, what would you imagine that person is if you're the one that is staging yourself that way? So it's always really a, a matter of um, identification and uh, always along the way, uh, seeing that they themselves really build a strong sense of identification in, in that kind of role. That's brilliant. I love that uh, framing of having, you know, who would the community want to speak to them as a reliable um, source and, and creator and, and uh, collaborator. I love that. Um, we, we do have other questions prepared, but I, I want to make sure that the folks who are here have a chance to ans ask some questions. And we're small enough that I think you could just unmute and ask your question directly of an individual panelist or for all of the panelists. And I know Dr. Celedon Petitius needs to, to leave here for a dissertation defense, which is part of what we're talking about, right? So we want to make sure that you're able to, to exit. I don't know if you have any parting words while people are thinking about questions. Yeah, no, I think um, the piece that I wanted to highlight too is that um, because you had a question about what have we learned from students. And I think the piece that really was fascinating to me is how, how they're so, so ready for more. Um, we were prepared to do level one, level two of the curriculum, and then they went through it and it's like, what's next? <laughs> so they, the community wanted more, the teachers wanted more, the students wanted more. Um, and then, so, and, and also um, taking lessons learned from, from what we learned from them to, to adapt to what happens in the classroom. And Marios could talk a lot more on that piece too, how that has changed and transformed his own teaching and engineering courses um, and also in our education courses. So, um, so there's a lot that we've learned um, from the communities that we work with. So anyway, just wanted to highlight that. Thank you so much. And, and I hope it's a great dissertation defense. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> See you. Any questions from the audience? Um, anybody have any specific questions? I have a, I have a question. Sorry, I could get the right camera. It's Dave Anton here from bi biology. Mm -hmm. uh, and so my question uh, really is, uh, you know, how, what people think are good ways to, to sort of scale up their uh, efforts if it comes through. I Things I've tried before, you know, you get, if, if in my mind, if we're successful uh, in in this, we get a few people. We get people wanting to come in our labs and our colleagues' labs. But you know, once I get past ten students, <laughs> or even five students, you know, for real research projects, it becomes a a challenge. So, what are some thoughts to say? How do we scale up what you guys have been doing to, or what any of us been doing to, hundreds of students or or thousands of students being getting, getting supported? Dave, I think that's a great question. And we've, we've kind of been engaged in this um, recently because um, this graduate training program that we've gotten off the ground this year, um, you know, really requires working with evaluators. And, and, you know, we've put this course together as a group of faculty um, and really kind of worked through the curriculum and, you know, kind of thought about it. But of course, now we've got it out there and we're working with the students and actually seeing what works and doesn't work. And the idea is to kind of work on this course over the next four years or so and get this feedback and sort of do this iterative process where we get this thing into something that we think we can actually uh, put out there to institutions that have the resources that we're talking about, like the museum resources, for example, and use this as a, as a you know, almost a standard to sort of 
um, provide an interdisciplinary research experience uh, for for graduate students. So the way we're taking the way we're working on this is we're we're basically trying to really open ourselves up to um, really honing our practices and thinking about our practices and working through the pedagogy and that kind of stuff, and then ultimately kind of preparing not only some papers and things to kind of get the idea out there, but also have some real examples of how to kind of execute a course like this and, and how it works, how well does it meet its goals and those kinds of things. And I'm going to jump in, if I may, um, with, with sort of two thoughts to add, because it is kind of an institutional question um, in addition to an individual researcher, teacher trying to build something. But at a certain point, it gets large enough that it's really beyond the ability of an individual faculty member to manage. And I think that's kind of where, where you were going. So um, the creation of the Undergraduate Research Arts and Design Network um, that Dr. Schroeder is, is directing was really intended to, to try to start tackling that that problem and so in kind of a, a next phase um, the 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 goal really is to try to build capacity and take some of the hiring work nuts and bolts work um, uh, administrative work uh, and and also um, scaling work off of the shoulders of faculty and and have the university kind of take on more more of that um, right now we're really at the you know looking at models um, getting uh, people involved trying to come up with a design and taking advantage of what you know Tom was just talking about with the graduate model is certainly part of the picture there but the the second thing that I wanted to add and and dr. Schroeder just um, made himself visible so that's the guy to go to if you want to build undergraduate research. That's that's his his job. Um, but the second thing that I, I wanted to add is that um, I, I'm convinced at this point that we're not going to get to that scaling ability unless we have a better model for work on campus for our students um, and with a, you know, better um, wages um, and also um, a, 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 a more uh, less friction in in hiring um, than we currently have um, so that students have a reason to work on campus and to become involved in in research so that's a going to be a big focus for me moving forward i haven't figured out how to do it yet but i think that that's kind of critical because otherwise our students are going to be working at subway because they need a living wage um, so that's that's part of the i think the larger puzzle particularly for our, our undergraduates did anybody else on the panel want to chime in on this question of, of scale um, and and i know that maybe dr hohola will have some ideas around that since he's worked with large numbers of students yeah i guess my kind of uh, immediate reaction was um from our grounding, we're not really motivated to deal with uh, pushing large groups of students through the program because um, we really are oriented towards kind of almost individualized instruction. Um, the way that we've designed our curriculum, for example, is really based on this kind of cohort uh, experience. So when students come in, they basically um, see and develop these kind of lifelong uh, associations with their peers that serve them once they go into the profession itself. So um, we do offer large generalized courses at the beginning of uh, the undergraduate experience, but even there, um, we still continue to sort of model real um, local-based experiences the kind of practicum so that they can take the general theories and approaches and actually put them in use within their own particular community. So um, that, you know, with, with the hard sciences, you know, I, I know that uh, you can handle large, large classes, but from our case, um, unless it's a general survey course, you know, we really don't go that direction at all. Great, thanks so much. And I, I'm seeing another question in the chat um, from Dr. Goodwin um, about models in, in the humanities. Um, and I, I think I might have to take that one because I think I'm the only humanities person um, on the, uh, in, in the group here, unless somebody else wants to, to take a, a, a stab at it. I know, you know, archeology span was certainly, certainly qualified, archeology span and anthropology in some, some definitions of humanities. Hannah, did you want to go after it or um, you want me to take it? You know, I'm still my brain still still kind of turning this question of, of sort of how how I could sort of scale, you know, what it is that I do up. So 
<laughs> I'm interested in what everyone else has to say. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, in terms of the humanities, and, and maybe we're just about to close on this because it's it's twelve fifty seven. Um, it's it's really difficult. Um, so one thing I would I would suggest is um, looking a little bit more um, at some of the work that's being done in the digital humanities because that's actually a place where students can engage from very very early on. Um, the library offers. Um, some uh, really nice sessions on how to become a Wikipedia contributor. Um, and that can be a really nice way in getting students in the humanities to think about making sure that um, the information that's out there in the world um, is information that's been vetted by peer researchers and also in providing um, information. So you can, this is just one example, um, but you could actually select um, a couple of Wikipedia entries that are related to what you're doing in a course and then work with the library on having students become uh, Wikipedia editors and, and contributors and then use your capacity as somebody who's got a research position to actually help um, with that. So that's that's one possibility. Something that I've sometimes done with students as well is um, to get them involved in, in building um, websites, maybe using some of the Adobe Creative Cloud um, tools that are out there and making sure that um, when they're producing a particular website or um, portfolio um, or um, uh, even just a, um, a, a spark report um, that they're being very careful to integrate um, research that they themselves have done um, and that they've they've created a really um, very tangible research question as they move through the development i find that having a visual interface um, breaks up the weight of having to write a research paper and it also gives them the sense that they actually have an audience out there as opposed to the really traditional um, you know write a five page paper write a 12 page paper and research it um, well and then lastly if there are things that you're doing in which you need um, someone to consult uh, reference sources or to nail down the specifics around something it's a very it's a very small thing but actually providing um, a, a student with the tools to go look at a particular reference source and nail down even just definitions um, for you can be a, a great thing to do um, I sometimes will use um, uh, old dictionaries um, from, I, I work in um, French and British literature, um, and so I, I'll ask students to look at different dictionary definitions from the past um, and for, use those definitions as the basis for thinking about how ideas change over the time. That's very tangible. It's very easy to manipulate those dictionaries. A lot of them are available online, and so they can work really actively in thinking about how ideas change by working through dictionary definitions from, you know, I don't know, 1750 to 1857 to, to the present. So just a couple of ideas. Any parting shots, things that people would like to say in closing? I know we're at one o'clock here. If I could just pop in real quick, I just wanted to say that the UNM um, eCure program, which is funded by NSF, I've put in the link, uh, that really does uh, kind of allow instructors to use different kind of approaches in undergraduate research. Even if you're not in a STEM field, I would encourage you to apply for that when the, when the call for proposal comes out in the spring. Uh, OVPR has funded some non-STEM faculty to participate in the past, and I'm certainly looking to try to find funding for non-STEM uh, this, this year as well. I'm just tremendously grateful to all of you. Um, my brain's moving quickly here. Um, and I and thank you uh, for the time and, and for the work that you're doing, which uh, I know will amplify your own research and is certainly uh, expanding the lives of your undergraduates and your graduate students. Um, and Julia's back. So yes, thank you all. I've, I've really enjoyed this. Thanks very much, Pamela and all of the panelists. Also, Hannah Torres and Monica Fischel, our partners in uh, collaborative uh, seminars and, and webinars in the Faculty Research Development Office. And I hope everyone has a good day. And I want to encourage everyone during the break next week to take a breath. We've got the push of two weeks left when we come back. So make sure you're, as part of your, your break, you take a breath. And thanks again, everyone. Thank you.